Good evening. It's good to see everybody. Glad that you are here and those that are joining us online. Glad to have you with us as well. Um, we have announcements to remind you Sunday uh, morning, Sunday school worship service at their regular time, Sunday afternoon. Uh, we are planning to take a group down to Flower Hill and climb Flower Hill. And there actually is a path that's been put through there in the last several years so you there's a parking lot before you get to the bottom of the hill and you can go and it's actually a uh more like a, a just a normal path out through the woods so almost anybody can go if you're really energetic you can go around the other side and try to climb the hill and we'll wait for you at the top but uh, uh we'll do that and then we're all planning to go uh back to linda's house uh after that and, and uh to our, our home, and we're going to have some refreshments of one kind or another. Um, is the list? Vicky has Vicky been. Has okay, well, if you hadn't signed up, uh, just bring something anyway. Um, <laughs> but And they'll have that Sunday morning for sure. Uh, we, I think they're doing some ice cream, but also doing some uh, a cake or sandwiches or chips or yeah, just in, almost anything. Just something, something to snack on a little while, and we'll share some fellowship together. Uh, other announcements? If not, I wonder before we share in prayer if there are those you might wish to mention for us to remember. remember yeah, just remember the Johnny Tool family and also the Ronnie Mayo family. Both of those passed away in the last couple of days. And Sam was just sharing a situation about children over at Micro, the grandmother who keeps them um, has to have surgery. It's a real long, complicated story. Just remember, her name is Renee Watson. It's not the doctor Renee, but right. just remember that family situation. Okay. I had a thought that just on top of my head that sent off to be looked at by the Okay. Okay. He never died, and she has that procedure on Friday. On Friday, isn't it? Yep. I got a brace report. I had the stress test done, and it came back. Everything was wonderful. Amen. Amen. So you you were unstressed, huh? That's right. I was there unstressed. You go. <laughs> Oh, okay, well, <laughs> it'll create stress, for sure. Others, we've got several that's been on our prayer list for a good long while. We want to continue to remember each of those, of course. Bill, would you lead us? Let's pray together. Seems that we have more and more people coming. And we ask that you would help us to bring even more people to your knowledge and your understanding. And that they would believe and take time from their schedule to come and be a part of the church and what it means to be a part of this family that we have here. We ask that you be with the ones that lost loved ones, those that are sick and suffering too, Lord. And as we go into our service this evening, Lord, we ask that you give our pastor the word to say to help make us better Christians so that we may go forward with that word in the days to come. All that we ask and bless in your name, Lord. Amen. 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 
Have your Bibles, invite you to turn to the book of Nehemiah, the fourth chapter. Last week we looked at the uh, work that was done and kind of a survey of it that uh, went around the wall and the different gates that were there, the areas close to those, the ones that were working on those. Well, as is always the case, when uh, the Lord's work starts being done, uh, Satan decides that he wants to do something to try to hinder it. So uh, chapter 4 is the beginning of actually a, a series of chapters that uh, tell us of diverse ways uh, that, uh, that they were uh, hindered in the work uh, that, they, uh, that they were going to do. Um, somebody said that uh, you ought to uh, love your neighbors and love your enemies, and somebody says because they're the same people. So, uh, that, <laughs> not not sure how how true that is. But in this case, uh, one of the neighbors that was uh, of this group was a man named Sanballat. Now, Sanballat was introduced to us way back in the earlier part of this when uh, when Nehemiah first shows up. Uh, Sanballat is one of the ones who. Uh, is not happy to see him. Now, Sam Ballot was a uh, was a governor. Uh, he actually was uh, a, a a governor uh, for the uh, the area of Samaria, uh, and he was uh, under uh, the king of Persia. So he actually is in a in a parallel position to what Nehemiah is now, because Nehemiah has been sent to be the governor of Jerusalem. Uh, he's the governor of Samaria, but uh, if if you remember, the areas around Jerusalem and the and the Jews that lived in Jerusalem, there was a lot of conflict always, and so uh, that that's a part of what uh, took uh, took place here. And they were perfectly happy for the people to come back and live in Jerusalem as long as they lived in the ruins of Jerusalem. But they did not want it to become a fortified city because the stronger it is. <laughs> the weaker that they become. In other words, uh, you, uh, you can measure your strength by two ways. You can just measure it by how strong you are, but you can measure it compared to someone around you. And unfortunately, a lot of times, uh, people want to lift their self up by tearing somebody else down. If, if I can be uh, comparatively better than you, then that makes me better, even though I may not be any better. And so uh, the situation begins. Now, actually, chapter 4, chapter 5, and chapter 6 uh, deal with some of the different tactics that were used by the enemy to try to stop the work that was taking place. And this evening, we're going to look uh, at the, that the first part of that. Now, Satan attacks in the same kind of way. It's uh, over and over throughout history, throughout Scripture. You see all kinds of different ways uh, that it takes place. And so some of these are very, very familiar. And in fact, we've, we've actually already mentioned a certain extent of it, but it goes in a little more depth here. The first thing that's mentioned uh, is uh, the ridicule of the people, the first six verses. Uh, but it so happened when Sanballat heard that we were re rebuilding the wall that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren in the army of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? Now, those, those verses right there uh, is Sanballat uh, making, uh, an, an, uh, 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 making fun of them. Uh, somebody has said that, uh, uh, that a person that is brave when they are shot at will, will collapse when they're laughed at. And you know, for some people, it's easier to deal with a physical attack than it is to be ridiculed and be made fun of. Uh, it's not unusual at all in Scripture to see that. Do you remember a story in the Bible where there was a young boy that came up against a giant, uh, Goliath? And what did Goliath do when David came out? Even though he was much stronger, it, it, he shouldn't have been concerned at all about what was going to happen. Well, maybe he should have been concerned about what was going to happen because it didn't turn out too well for him. But on, on the surface, you would not think so. And yet he makes fun of him. Why does he have to ridicule him? Uh, somehow, uh, somehow ridicule is, is a weapon that is used uh, by, by Satan and his crowd all the time. Jesus was mocked 
uh, when he was at trial. Uh, the soldiers there uh, mocked him and made fun of him. The rabble hanging around the cross made fun of Jesus while he was uh, hanging on the cross. There have been many times uh, throughout Scripture that we see stories of where the people of God, when they were working, uh, that they were ridiculed. But one of the things that you can tell is when the enemies of the Lord start laughing, it means God's about to bless. Uh, there's almost a parallel to that. Uh, when you, you stick with it, uh, and when they begin to laugh, he begins to bless. Well, Sam Ballant and his friends, they use uh, several different ways uh, of, of, the, uh, of the, the ridicule here. And we mentioned that if you go all the way back in the second chapter, uh, they actually made fun of him when he showed up. But here we find some specific things that he said. The first thing, he ridiculed them by calling them feeble Jews. Uh, but the, the, the feeble Jews, what are these feeble Jews uh, going to do? Well, you know, now that means uh, that, that kind of was actually true uh, because they were, they were a very small group of people. They were not particularly strong. And, in the, and on the, the, the surface of it, uh, he, he was kind of telling the truth. And, you know, sometimes the truth hurts. And, and here they were trying to accomplish something. And he says, what are these feeble uh, Jews uh, going to do. And then he goes on the second thing he says, and, and will they fortify themselves? What, what are they going to do? Are they going to, are they going to build for themselves uh, a means uh, of protection, a means by which uh, they will, uh, they will, will even perhaps fight? He goes on and says, uh, will, will they offer sacrifices? Now at this point, he begins to actually, uh, to, to blaspheme the Lord. But will they offer sacrifices? Uh, it takes more than, than prayer and worship to get this job done. Do you remember how we've had this happen uh, in our country in the last uh, two or three years where we had situations where uh, there, uh, there was a mass shooting or something like that, and you had people come out and say that they were praying for the families that were involved and have some people actually ridicule that. We don't need people praying. We need to get us some gun control. We need to get us some laws. We need to, to control this stuff. We don't need, we don't need prayer. Well, you, all the other things might be necessary, might be needful, but you sure saw the need prayer. Uh, and there's never a time that it's, that it's not a, appropriate to be offering sacrifices, to be worshiping. He goes on and says, uh, will they, will they finish uh, this uh, in a day, uh, suggesting that they didn't even know what a, what a job they had, or have they taken on something that they have no idea uh, what is going to happen, they probably will just give up and quit. Now, one of the reasons that they said that is because this had already happened. This had happened before. They had begun the process, and they had given up, and they had stopped. And you know, one of the things that's, that's always a shame to see is when God's people tackle off anything, take a job and begin to do it without realizing what the task is they have and make sure that they're up to the task and they're willing to stick with it. Never quit halfway. Well, then he, he comes on beyond that. And, and the last thing he says is the materials that they were going to use. He makes fun of them. How, are they going to try to build a wall out of the rubble that's left from the wall that fell down? Well, and, and he even mentions uh, something about the, the, the stones being burned. Well, it is true uh, a good part of the wall was built from limestone, and limestone can be damaged if it's in a fire. But if you read what it actually says, it says the walls had been torn down and the gates had been burned because the gates were, were made out of wood and the gates were burned, but the walls were just knocked down. And, and in reality, the wall was not completely gone. There were just holes in the wall. Uh, they had come to places and they would knock it down, uh, and and the the rock that had been, stones that had been a part of the wall they were still laying there. The, the the material was there; it was just out of place. And you know, I thought about that when I was reading. How many times do we find that in our in our country, uh, in our day, in our culture, in our own personal lives, even that we we wind up in trouble, we wind up in a problem. And it's not that the answer is not there. The thing that we knocked down and threw off to the side is exactly what we need to build it back. And unfortunately, we have, we've allowed through the years 
many of the things that are the foundations, the, the stones, if you will, from which the Christian faith was built to have been tossed off to the side. And when people say we want to build it back, what do we want? We need some new material. We need some new stuff. We need some different kind of things. Now, it, there's nothing wrong with using some different uh, methods and things like that, but the foundation upon which you build your faith is always going to be the same or it's going to be a false faith. And so he questions and he ridicules the material that they're going to use. Well, then you have Tobiah, who was an Ammonite. He was one who was visiting, apparently, with the Samaritans when they came to see what's going on. And so he picks up in verse 3. Now, Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, Whatever they build, if even a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. So he suggests that what they're building is going to be so weak that, that you can just, uh, 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 one little fox can run into it and will knock it over. You know, the, the truth is that if that's the case, uh, they have, uh, had failed uh, to take a look at what's there because the, uh, I was reading one of the commentaries said that when the archaeologists have gone into the area where it's being built, in some places this wall was nine feet thick. I mean, that's a wall now. You know, when we build a wall around here, you know, we build a, 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 a block and brick maybe a little bit and maybe a you know, really big one would be a couple of feet. Nine feet thick to create a wall. It's going to be pretty substantial. Now, when all this happens and the ridicule that's taking place, how does Nehemiah respond to it? Because you would say, well, the first thing he needs to do is he needs to just lay them out. He needs to just let them know What's what? But that's not at all what he does. Instead, what it says is that Nehemiah responds with prayer. Listen in verse 4. Hear, O, o our God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their own heads. Give them as plunder to a land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity. Do not let their sin be blotted out from before you, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. Now, when he prays here, uh, he, he, is, he is praying in response to uh, the, the ridicule and the sneering that has taken place uh, from them. He, the, the Lord heard what they said. Uh, Nehemiah did not, did not himself uh, get involved in anything here. He just says, Lord, I'm going to put this in your hands. The first thing he does is he prays. This is the third time already so far in this, in this uh, book we're studying that Nehemiah has gone to the Lord. The first time was when he heard the message, he went to the Lord and said, Lord, I, I, I need to help. I need to know what to do. He, he then again had gone and had prayed uh, when he saw what had happened and said, Lord, you, you have to enable us to do the job. And now here he comes again when the attack comes, instead of, instead of returning the, their ridicule on them or trying to get in a verbal uh, battle with them. Instead, he just uh, he just turns around and gives it to the Lord, and he says, "Lord, you deal with it, and you deal with it in your way." Now, some people read this passage and get a little bit offended by it because he basically, well, tells them where to go. <laughs> you know, that's the nicest way to put it. I mean, the most honest way. He says, "Lord, I don't want you to give them any benefit. I don't want you to forgive their sin. I don't want you to. I want you to make them be captive and then kill them and send them where bad people go." I mean, he 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 said, "But of course, Lord, I'm leaving it in your hands." So, <laughs> so, but he was he was serious. But now you have to understand this was in response to their attack against God's people and against God's work. And so he he uh, says here. Now, one thing we always remember. The thing that somebody says to you, a verbal attack, it can never hurt you unless you let it. You're the one that's going to make a decision to how you respond to it. Uh, and, and all of us have been there. We've always been times where people say something and they hurt your feelings, but are they, can they really harm you? Can they really do you harm? Not unless you let it. Uh, and Nehemiah is a perfect example here of someone who says, we aren't going to let them hinder us. We're going to keep doing what we're called to do. Well, the next thing we notice is, uh, in verse 6, he says, so we built the wall 
and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. When Nehemiah goes back to them and encourages them, says, don't pay attention to any of that that's going on, keep working. Uh, and, and very quickly, they had the wall back up to half its height all the way around. And so the sections where the wall had been torn down, they were able to bring it back in to build it back. They were closing the gaps in the wall. And now it is uh, to half its height. Why? Because the people had a mind to work. They could have decided, they could have done a lot of things. They could have, they could have quit. They could have all got mad. They could all uh, got involved in scuffles or anything else, but they kept working and they accomplished the purpose. It was up to half its height. Now, verse seven. Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored again and the gaps were beginning to be closed, they became very angry. And all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to our God and because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. Okay, so what happens is the, the, the people around that were, that were enemies of each other now suddenly become a common enemy to the people, of, um, to the people uh, here in Jerusalem. Uh, the city was basically surrounded from what he says here on the north side was Sanballat and the Samaritans. To the east side was Tobiah and the Ammonites. To the south was Geshem and the Arabs. And to the west was the Ashdodites. Now, Ashdod was a city uh, in, in Philistia, uh, and Philistia is where the Philistines are from. And so all these people that you hear, they're not people that are particularly friendly to the people in Jerusalem anyway. But you know, isn't it amazing how hard it is sometimes to get God's people to all get together and work on something. But the devil never has that problem. He never has problems. I mean, you, if, you, if you're looking at something, you're trying to get something right done, you'll have a bunch of people in favor of it, but they're running around like chickens all different directions. But you let something wrong, some evil something, boy, they pile up, they're all arm in arm, work together and get it going. The devil's crowd is always ready to work together to defeat the work of God. And, and it, it's tragic that sometimes we as, as God's people are not as willing to work together to accomplish his business as the devil's crowd is to work together to get that done. There's a lot of examples of that uh, throughout scripture. And so here we see the enemy sees the work is progressing, seeing something's been done, and immediately there's an attack. Uh, one of the things that uh, we've had within our church uh, for the last uh, several years as, as, as things are going so well in our church, there's such a, a marvelous spirit of cooperation and love uh, and fellowship with one another and one of the things, and, and I have said it to many of you as individuals, and, and our deacons talk about it every month when we meet, and that is to constantly, constantly be on the alert because the devil is going to try to find a way to create a problem. He's always looking a way that he can stick his toe in a crack and get somebody upset and get this one talking to that one. And if we can ever start that just a little bit and then get folks start choosing sides. And if we can get folks within the church to start choosing sides, now we've begun to beat the work of God. And so it's something we need to always be very, very uh, careful about in what we're doing. And so uh, Nehemiah understood what was happening. Uh, he saw that the, the attacks were coming. And so because of that, it says he began uh, to post uh, guards. And, and it says here that he, uh, we made our prayer to our God and because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. Then Judah said, the strength of the laborers is failing and there is much rubbish that we are not able to build the wall and our adversary said, they will neither know nor see anything till we come into their midst 
and kill them and cause the work to cease. So it was when the Jews who dwelt near them came <coughs> that they told us ten times from whatever place you turn, they will be upon us. Well, what do we see happening here is the people begin to get discouraged. They hear what's, what's being said. They, they hear somebody saying, hey, there's an army coming that way. In fact, there's an army coming every way. Here we are in the middle. Uh, we're not an army. These were not, these were not armed people. Uh, they were not really prepared to fight per se. But here we are, and they're all around us. And every way we look, uh, we, see, we see some of these things uh, that are taking place. And dis discouragement is a weapon that, that Satan will use every time that he can against you as an individual or against a group of people. And they began to, to he, he knew if, if they could get discouraged, they would beat themselves. You don't have to beat them if they get uh, discouraged. And so they begin, it, it, one of the perfect examples of that, if you go back in the Old Testament, we are in the Old Testament, we go back earlier in the Old Testament, when uh, the children of Israel came to Kadesh Barnea, and, um, and they sent the spies. And they sent the spies to go out and to look at the land. They sent 12 spies out. And when they came back, 10 of the spies said, it's a great looking place, but them people are big and they're mean and there's no way we can take them. And Joshua and Caleb said, with God with us, we're well able to do it. But the 10 prevailed and the people became discouraged and because of it, they did not enter the promised land. And in fact, if you, if you read that passage of Scripture uh, in Numbers chapter 13, it says the people became discouraged in their hearts. Discouraged in their hearts. Not, not tired physically, but inside in their hearts, they begin to give up. We're not able. We can't do it. Look at all the problems. Look at all the tasks that are there. And that is something that is so easy to happen and there's always going to be somebody pointing out to you why you can't do something or why you cannot accomplish something uh, and, and, and thank the Lord there's always somebody too wanting to, to build you up. Now notice here uh, that is specifically mentioned um, in verse 10 that uh, the, the people of Judah said the strength of the laborers is failing. Now, why did, the, why did the tribe of Judah, the people from the tribe of Judah, turn against them? Well, we don't know everything about it, but one thing we know is that they had, be, they had begun uh, to, to intermingle with the people around them. And we find when you actually come down uh, later over in the, I believe it's the 13th chapter before you get to it, that it actually describes that they had married with the people from Samaria, and because of that, both their marriages and their desire for wealth of uh, doing business with them became more important to them than serving the Lord. And, and sadly, that happens, uh, that happens all, all too often. Well, one thing about it, when all this is taking place, uh, all the, the complainers are taking place, and they begin to tell uh, everything about it, said some that, that, uh, that dwelt around them, they told them, uh, they told them ten times it says, and that's not a that's not a literal ten times in the Hebrew. That says they said it over and over and over and over. Every day we heard them, we were hearing that same thing uh, over and over. And gradually, what happens with that is now what is discouragement turns into fear, and fear is one of the greatest enemies of anything that we ever try to accomplish. And so here comes this, these people saying, hey, there's, there's going to be a secret attack. These people are coming. They've got a large army uh, tonight when we're not watching. They're going to sneak in. They're going to get us, uh, and, and, and they're, going to, they're going to come after us. Um, all of us remember, don't remember happening, but remember hearing about it uh, when Franklin Roosevelt uh, addressed the nation, says the only thing we've got to fear is fear itself. Well, fear can cause you to be paralyzed. It causes you to just stop right where you are and not know what to do. In addition to that, fear is contagious. When one person gets it, it begins to spread to other people. And, and fear can, needs to be replaced with faith. Fear and faith can't coexist at the same time. I've, I've mentioned it a lot of times. In fact, I've done a couple of messages through the years on that. How many times in the Bible 
that we hear fear not. Every time you're in a, 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 a tough situation and the angel of the Lord comes and speaks, the first thing he always says is don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid because our natural tendency is when something's about to happen uh, to be afraid. And so here uh, the fear has come. And so how does Nehemiah respond to that? Well, the first thing we find that he does is he begins uh, to post uh, guards uh, around them everywhere. Look in verse 13. Therefore, I position men behind the lower parts of the wall at the openings, and I set the people according to their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And so what he did was he took the people and basically divided them uh, into groups, and there were groups that were working, and there were groups that were guarding. And the ones that were guarded would put together families because they knew they'd look out for each other. They do. They would do a better job working together and put them close to their homes. And so you had the you had the area that was around uh, that was protecting them. And so the first thing that he did uh, was he got them uh, together. And then notice what he says uh, after that. He says, uh, "Set the people according to their families, their swords, their spears, and most." And I looked and arose and said to the nobles to the leaders, to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord great and awesome and fight for your brethren, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. And so he comes and he encourages them by reminding them what they're about doing. Uh, it is, uh, it's one thing for me to be involved in some of my petty, puny little stuff and for it not to work and to get a little bit discouraged about it. When I'm about the business of the Lord, and I know, I know that what I'm doing is the right thing, I can be confident that God's spirit is with me and his God and his protection is with me. And now some people don't believe that, don't like that, but I'm going to tell you what, I depend on it. I depend on the fact that when I'm confident that what I'm doing is the right thing, that I'm going to have the protection and the care and the strength of God there with him. So he says, remember what you're fighting for. You're fighting uh, for the Lord. You're fighting for your brethren, your sons, your families, your daughters, your wives, your homes, all of this you protect. And so then verse 15, and it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had brought their plot to nothing, that all of us returned to the wall, everyone to his work. So that the, the people around when they realized that they were not going to be afraid of them, uh, they withdrew. And the attack didn't take place. But look, verse 16, So it was from that time on that half of my servants worked at construction while the other half held the spears, the shields, the bows, and wore armor, and the leaders were behind all the houses of Judah. Those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction, with the other they held a weapon. We mentioned this, I think, last week. But you see the picture here. Here's a guy uh, that's bringing the equipment here, I mean the materials. Here's somebody working on the wall, and, and I'm bringing material back and forth. And while I'm bringing the material, I'm carrying it with one hand, but I got my spear in my other hand or my sword in my other hand. And those who were working on the wall uh, while they were there, verse 18, every one of the builders had his sword girded at his side as he built, and the one who sounded the trumpet was beside me. So what he had done, he had taken everybody that was there and said, we're not stopping work. We're not going to let them scare us, but at the same time, we're going to fortify ourselves. And so while they worked, here were some that were that were actually uh, doing the work. Now, I've never done a whole lot of uh, masonry work, but I've laid a little bit of sloppy brick, and uh, and it takes two hands to do it. There's no way to do it one hand. So you're, you're working with both hands uh, while you're about that business, but you got your sword right there just in case. And you got another guy over here that's bringing material back and forth, and he keeps his sword not only in his hand, but he's got it drawn all the time. And he says, in addition to that, then we had uh, the trumpet. The ones who sounded the trumpet was beside me. So what they had done now, they had provided a means by which they could put out the word if they needed to. If I sound the trumpet, you come to the place where it is. They were spread out all over the wall working, but if there was to be an attack at one spot, 
uh, the trumpet would be sounded, and when it was sounded, they would come uh, from the area where they were, and they would begin uh, to move in that direction. And, and it, I, I just I could not help but think about that. No matter who they were, no matter where they were, no matter what they were doing, they were working, but they were listening for the sound of the trumpet. And that's where you and I need to be in our world today. We don't need to sit down beside what's happening in our world. We need to be at work in our world. We need to be about the Father's business all the time, every way that we can, uh, doing all the things that we can. But at the same time, one ear always needs to be tilted up, waiting to hear the sound of the trumpet. You know, if you live as a Christian in the awareness and the conviction that the Lord may return at any moment, I think it changes how you do everything. I think it changes how you do everything. Uh, I, I remember uh, as a youngster growing up, uh, if, if you were in a situation that uh, you were left somewhat unsupervised uh, to do a job, you probably weren't quite as good at it as if somebody was there. But I tell you what, if you were about and you're supposed to be getting it done and somebody hollers and says, Daddy's coming or whoever's coming, you got with it. When I first started uh, working, uh, and I've done construction work all my life, and when I started doing construction work, you'd be working or whatever. If you, if you, if somebody said the boss is coming, somebody says the foreman's coming, somebody come, whoever is in charge, they're coming. Everybody perks up just a little bit, uh, and uh, because you you you're watching for that, you're listening for that. Well, we need to be in that same kind of situation. Uh, scripture says, 1 Thessalonians 4.10, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And then in addition to that, and we'll move on down in the closing verses here, Nehemiah also uh, instituted, if you will, uh, a second uh, shift uh, of people. He says, uh, look, look down in verse 21, So we labored in the work, and half of the men held the spears from daybreak until the stars appeared. At the same time, I also said to the people, let each man and his servant stay at night in Jerusalem, that they may be our guard by night and a working party by day. So they had the people that even if they didn't live in the city, now they were staying in the city. He said, everybody stay here. You stay here at night. You, you may, uh, while you're asleep even, you sleep with your sword by your side. If the trumpet sounds, you be ready to jump up uh, and, and be a part of what's happening. And another thing that you notice here is uh, that Nehemiah uh, was not only a leader giving instruction, but he was a leader following his own destruction. Look, his own instruction. Look at verse 23. So neither I, my brethren, my servants, nor the men of the guard who followed me took off our clothes, except that everyone took them off for washing. Now, what he's saying here, we didn't take a break. We didn't take a break. I mean, I was in charge, but I was right in the middle of what was happening. I didn't say, now, you guys get that taken care of. I'm going to go take a coffee break. He was right in the middle of what was happening. He said for the whole, for the whole period of time, and when they say take off their clothes, uh, they're talking about uh, their outer garments that they had for working. They were always ready to work. They were always ready to fight. They were always prepared uh, other than uh, to wash, and we appreciate him putting that note in there because uh, that probably, it probably was a good eye anyway. If you notice here, though, there's some things that happen here. There's several different uh, statements that are made through this passage here, and, uh, and one man, uh, his name was uh, Dr. Alan Redpath. He's passed away now, but he, he wrote an article on why the Jews were able to accomplish this, and this is what he said in that. He said they were able to get their work done and keep the enemy at bay because they had a mind to work, verse 6. They had a heart to pray, verse 9. They had an eye to watch, verse 9. They had an ear to hear, verse 20. And this gave them the victory in the midst of what they were doing. And so you think about those kind of things. Somebody that, that has a mind to work, has a heart to pray, has an eye to watch, has an ear to hear. And they're always on the alert, always ready. This group of people... Uh, it's amazing uh, what what they were able to accomplish. And as we move on into it, we're going to see just how amazing it is, uh, the work that they did and how quickly they were able to finish it. But uh, here we see the beginning of the opposition that was there. And, um, and sadly, that's not something that's changed uh, 
in our world today. Anything to add before we close? Let's pray. God, we thank you for the time we have to be here again this evening. And we ask you to guide us as we continue uh, through this study. Help us see the truths there that just will enable us as we live our lives each day to be more faithful to you and more willing to serve in the ways that we can, the opportunities that we have. Always watchful, always careful. Lord, we're mindful of the ones that were mentioned this evening. The others come to our minds and hearts that have needs, and we lift each one. We ask that you go with us as we leave from here and guide us in the steps we take each day. Help us in all ways to seek uh, to live in a way that you'll be pleased and others might be blessed. And we ask you to forgive our sin in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming. Thank <laughs> you.